tonight, a major ruling in Donald Trump's federal election interference case means the protective order is back on. A three-judge appeals court panel mostly upheld the original order from the trial judge, but they've narrowed it down. It bans Trump from attacking potential witnesses, court staff, and most prosecutors on the case. However, Trump is allowed to criticize the charges, the Justice Department, and special counsel Jack Smith himself. The judges explained the decision, writing, quote, Trump's public statements pose a significant and imminent threat. But they also said the district court's order, however, sweeps in more protected speech than is necessary. The former lead investigator on the January 6th committee said the judges had to thread the needle on this decision. I see the logic here, right? The former president is allowed to criticize the process, to criticize the motivation of the Justice Department. And now, after today's ruling by the appeals court, Jack Smith himself, he can't, however, challenge the integrity or say anything intended to influence actual potential witnesses. That is the key, right? It's, it's the potential attempt to say things that put pressure upon or influence witnesses or unfairly disparage them. Criticizing Jack Smith is criticizing the process, and that will have ripple effects on others. It is an imperfect balance, but the court trying very much to protect participants, but protect his free speech right. It makes that March 4th trial date increasingly firm. Meanwhile, the former president's $250 million civil fraud trial is winding down. He's expected to return to the witness stand on Monday. Today, an accounting expert testifying for the defense told the court that some of his nearly $900,000 in fees were paid by Trump's Save America Political Action Committee. Yesterday, he testified that he saw no evidence of accounting fraud in Trump's business. Meanwhile, we are also following the latest legal developments involving Hunter Biden. The president's son was indicted on nine tax-related charges on Thursday, including three felony counts. Now, the charges, of course, have nothing to do with President Biden. Hunter Biden is also the target of House Republicans who've been investigating him and who are pushing an impeachment inquiry into his father. Biden's son spoke out about the attacks from the Republicans in a podcast recorded before his latest indictment and released today. As long as my dad is president of the United States, they're not going to stop. They're trying to destroy a presidency. What they're trying to do is they're trying to kill me, knowing that it will be a pain greater than my father could be able to handle. Hunter Biden was also indicted in September on federal gun charges as part of the special counsel's investigation. If you would have said mm -hmm. a year and a half ago, what can we do to safely cool this economy but not tip ourselves into recession, right? We've had a year and a half of rate hikes, which could suddenly have businesses say, I'm not going to hire, I'm not going to invest, or consumers mm -hmm. stop spending. That didn't happen. So we're actually seeing that soft landing. It, it is a positive across the board, a really good report. Stephanie may not be here tonight, but we have to note her expertise on the November jobs report. It was better than expected, with 199,000 jobs added and unemployment dropping to 3.7 percent. President Biden was in Las Vegas today talking about the strength of the economy. All told, we've created 14 million jobs since you took office, more than any president has created in all four years of a term. Wages are up more than inflation. The economy grew by 5 percent this last quarter. America's had the strongest growth and now is the lowest inflation of any major economy in the world, but there's more to do. We know the prices are still too high for too many things. That's why I'm fighting to lower the cost for prescription drugs. Guess what? Insulin, 400 bucks a month for people. Guess what it is now? 35 bucks. Joining me now, John Allen, senior national politics reporter for NBC, Basil Smichael, Democratic strategist and former executive director of the New York State Democratic Party, and Susan Del Percio, veteran Republican strategist and MSNBC political analyst. John, let me start with you. Um, I was struck by the, the president's comments there, touting, saying, great, 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 but there's still more work to do. 
got lower prices. Uh, what was the reaction to these numbers today? I, I didn't hear much from Republicans on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I mean, first off, uh, the president has a big challenge, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who still feel like they're not doing as well as they'd like to be. And he's acknowledging that, but that's a difficult message. It's a two-part message. Look, we're doing greater with the economy. Everything looks good uh, this month. Um, and at the same time, still got to do better. In terms of Capitol Hill, Anytime these jobs reports come out, you have uh, you have a partisan divide. Mm -hmm. Democrats want to talk about uh, what they look at as a, a pretty good month and uh, pretty good quarter after quarter. And Republicans are not going to stop fighting each other <laughs> or fighting Democrats to praise Joe Biden, no matter what it says. Mm. Uh, Basil, something very notable, I thought, in these jobs numbers today, after months of bad vibes, consumer sentiment is finally starting to improve. How do you think the, the White House and more specifically, Specifically, the Biden campaign should message this? Yeah, that's an important question because I was moved by a New York Times article, excuse me, I don't remember who wrote it, but a couple of weeks ago that talked about the challenge that Americans have with the narrative around uh, capitalism. And that, that I thought about that a lot. And to Jonathan's point about messaging, I think the messaging on the actual numbers, the unemployment numbers, the jobs numbers, the the, the uh, inflation numbers, that's all great and it's important. But I think what the, what the White House needs to focus very closely on is addressing the issue of uh, bringing down the barriers to, economic, to the economic aspirations of Americans. Can they have a, a, a clearer path to getting that first home? Can they have a clearer path to moving into the middle class? I think that, particularly for a lot of young voters, is where a lot of the um, that that concern and that worry comes from, and I and I do think it's a it's a it's a messaging tweak. It's not minor, but it is something that I believe can be done and make a world of difference because the numbers are important. But if you you're not going to necessarily be focused on the numbers, you're going to be focused on you know can I plan for the future? And that's the that's the little tweak that I think the uh, the White House needs to make. Mm, Susan, this is such an important point uh, because the economic data it has been getting stronger for months, mm -hmm. frankly. But it feels like it's taken so long for sentiment to catch up. And it, that could be perhaps because of what people see and feel right in front of them. It, it is expensive to, to buy a house right now. Yeah, that's true. And, and let's not forget, about 18 months ago, there was a very strong narrative out there that there would be a recession. So they're almost coming back out of that narrative that there isn't a recession, that the economy is doing well. But you're absolutely right, Simone. It is difficult for people, and it's difficult for a couple of reasons. One, with the inflation we've seen, the ugly truth is, is that even as inflation comes down, prices do not. Now, I'm excluding supply ch chain issues um, for certain items, but for the most part, the prices are going to stay the same. So the question is, if I'm using my credit card, what's my interest rate on my credit card? How much am I getting and how much is it costing? Am I carrying every month? That's the statement I see. If I want to go out and buy a home now, the interest rates are just through the roof. It doesn't seem attainable. And those are the things that people feel. And they see it firsthand. They see it in their bills. And that's, I think, the disconnect. Now, as people feel better about the economy, that's certainly going to work in Joe Biden's favor. But I think his message, just to kind of play off of what Basil was saying, also needs to be, yes, we're doing better. But yes, there's so many of you that I recognize need to get a little more help. We need to do more for you and show the contrast that we could do better, both in the economy and how people are doing that way, but also lifting everybody up. I think this is why it's so important that we just we just give people the facts and we let them make their own decisions. And the facts are the economy is great, but the facts are also that things are still quite expensive. John, these are some more facts. Today, the president actually announced an eight point two billion billion with a B. OK, I had to underline it. <laughs> investment in rail. And it's part of the um, bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed in, in 2021. He announced it in Las Vegas. There will eventually be high speed rail from Las Vegas to L.A. There there's more high speed rail going across the country. I took the Amtrak the other day, John Allen, and I was just like, whoo, Lord, what is going on here? How do you think um, this, how big will this impact be? 
it's going to have a huge impact on the country, uh, on a country that has had uh, lagging infrastructure, whether you're talking about bridges or roads or you're talking about rail. So um, from a substantive standpoint, $8.2 billion can do a lot to update America's uh, rail infrastructure and modernize it. Um, in terms of a political impact, it's going to take a while before we mm -hmm. actually see this rail improving. So uh, if Joe Biden's in a second term, uh, he's going to get to take a lot of credit for it when people start to see that, start to feel that. Uh, I don't think they're going to start to feel that before the next election. Uh, you know, Basil, uh, the, the president has been traveling the country talking about infrastructure projects that he has funded. His cabinet has been out there. Um, I, I listened. To, there was a, a press call with Secretary Buttigieg um, the other day talking about this very thing. Is that, to John's point, is that the part of the winning message for 2024? Because people can see these projects going up. They can see, you know, I, I, I fly to, LA, to New York often. I can see the work being done at LaGuardia, but they might not feel the <laughs> effects of that work until 2025. Isn't LaGuardia so much better now? My God. It's I mean, y'all got to get rid of that carpet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I tell you, you know, uh, he, uh, Secretary Buttigieg was uh, visiting us at Hunter College about a month ago and addressed this very issue, that they're while they're spending a lot of money on these infrastructure products, he knows, as the administration knows, that they take time. They take years to, 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 be, to plan um, and to, and to, to get uh, started. Um, one of the things that I think that the Democrats should be, keep talking about is that these are by and large union jobs, um, which goes back to our earlier point about having the, uh, the ability to move people into the middle class through these jobs. Uh, but I would also say that there are some things that a lot of young voters really care about, not just about transportation, but about how the department is planning for climate change, how they're planning for resiliency. Um, there was a story a couple of uh, months ago that here in New York, uh, uh, there was a, a landslide, and you had mud on the tracks that actually stopped a very str uh, significant uh, artery of uh, trains going from New York City to, to the state capitol, uh, and it was related to climate change. So I think the connection to a lot of those hot-button issues, particularly among young voters, can motivate them. In and of themselves, they're important, but connecting them to how, again, we're planning for the future and talking about these really critical issues like resiliency and climate change.